The story of Vimy Ridge confronts Canadians once again. This time in a signal year. 100 years after the battle, 150 years since Confederation. Vimy's cries of triumph and mourning have echoed through the decades. Loudly at times, at others in whispers. Did it create a nation or expose its deep divisions? Battlefield victory? Or cautionary call for peace? Memory and meaning have shifted through time. So what should we make of it now? Because Vimy demands, always has, that we choose. Starting, as ever, with the battle itself, what it was and what it was not. It began early in the morning, April 9th, 1917, a cold Easter Monday. Canada's four divisions, 100,000 strong, and fighting as one for the first time, were grouped in order down the line. 15,000 infantrymen waiting for the attack to begin. It was utterly dark still, pitch black. You could hear this tremendous swish of the shells overhead and then just a continuous crash along the line. I felt that if I had put my finger up, I should have touched a ceiling of sound. Then they moved over the top from the heavy muck of their trenches and tunnels. Oh, if you weren't frightened, you were a fool. A man that said he wasn't is either a fool or a liar. Just as simple as that. We're just hoping that we could make it, that's all. Making it was far from assured. It was no foregone conclusion. The Germans had spent two and a half years fortifying the ridge. It was a very powerful position. In fact, more than 100,000 French soldiers had already died or been wounded trying to take it. His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, then attached to the Canadian Corps, he was accompanied by Generals Curry, Morrison, and Watson. Britain, Sir Julian Bing commanded the force, though Canadian Arthur Curry led one division. They had about three months to prepare for this battle. Uh, they integrated new infantry tactics, new artillery tactics. Curry had been sent by Bing to learn those tactics from the French. Curry is the man pushing this in the Canadian Corps, and Bing agrees. And these improvements begin to be implemented in time for Vimy. The assault used the so-called Vimy Glide, or creeping barrage. Large guns gave cover just ahead as soldiers ran forward with precise timing, 100 yards every three minutes. Soldiers know where they're to go. They look at the air photos, they look at the maps. They have a better sense of what they're to do. And it all worked, though nothing could prevent the battlefield horrors of the Great War. After two days, they captured most of the ridge with support from artillery units. War still fought with horses. On the fourth day, the highest point, the so-called pimple, fell. The battle was won, but at such a cost. It was uh, soil and mud and sweat and blood. It was where they achieved a great victory, but also where they lost thousands of their friends. 3,600 Canadian dead, 7,000 wounded. Men fight really for their comrades more than anything else, side by side, and brought out great acts of heroism and great acts of self-sacrifice for others. Still, after two years of losses, the Allies had needed a victory. The Canadians had delivered, and Arthur Curry soon took full command of Canada's troops. The Battle of Vimy Ridge was over. The debate over its meaning was just beginning. The victory had a huge impact on the soldiers and on the home front. What it did do was make the Canadians think that they were special, 
And they were. They were very, very good soldiers. And that mattered to Canada, to the Canadian Corps, to the soldiers. It was all over European newspapers. It came to, to uh, in Canadian newspapers. So uh, Canadians were very proud. The Allies were very happy. They brought Canada out of the First World War thinking, yes, I think we can be a country among nations and we have something really to contribute here. But for all that, the battle itself was of tactical importance only. It was later Canadian victories which actually helped end the war. The victories of the August, September, October, November 1918 tended to be forgotten, even right after the war. Those 100 days battles were championed by Arthur Curry himself. He thought other victories were more important. I think he was right. Yet it was Vimy that took hold in the Canadian imagination. Brigadier General A.E. Ross recalled its first moments. In those few minutes, he said, I witnessed the birth of a nation. A powerful image for a country still a decade away from full autonomy. Powerful, but not entirely accurate. Because Vimy helped convince Prime Minister Robert Borden that Canada needed more troops from across the country, leading directly to conscription. Conscription became a hugely divisive issue between French and English Canadians. It really split the country. So it's tough for anyone to argue that the Canadian nation was born at Vimy Ridge. But it was a tenacious idea, and decades later it would make a strong comeback. Before it did, though, there rose up a new monumental Vimy symbol for Canadians to contemplate. The Vimy Monument is arguably the single greatest monument to the First World War anywhere. And that monument weeps like no other monument I know for its lost sons who will never, ever come home. When you walk that, there's still thousands and thousands of Canadians uh, buried under that, that soil. The Canadian National Vimy Memorial sits on land donated by a grateful France. It's not until the building of the monument there in 1936, it's unveiling King Edward VIII, unveiling it, 6,000 pilgrims crossing the Atlantic. That really gives birth to the idea of Vimy. For this glorious monument, crowning the hill of Vimy, is now and for all time a part of Canada. Yet what Canada's king unveiled spoke not just of valor, sacrifice, or victory, but of loss and mourning. She is called Canada Bereft. Architect Walter Allward's central figure of his monuments 20. Here was Vimy tapping a different national emotion. I think the thing that really comes across to me more than anything else is the grief. The, the, the sorrow is expressed in the figures perhaps more um, poignantly than I've ever seen it anywhere else. No soldiers, no rifles, no helmets. Instead, a sword being broken. A fallen figure handing a torch to a comrade behind. Shades of Canada's most famous First World War poem. And the two soaring figures atop, justice and peace. Then there are these inscriptions. It became the gravestone for uh, over 11,000 soldiers who died uh, in France and who had no known uh, graves. The Vimy Memorial reached beyond its namesake battle, giving a resting place for fallen Canadians from every battlefield and a focal point for a country to remember an entire war. Around us here today there is peace and the rebuilding of hope. But then just three years later, the world went back to war. and Vimy receded from view.
The astonishing thing about Vimy is it's always been there waiting. When people decide they're going to go back and look seriously at the First World War again and see how it affected this country. Sure enough, two decades after the Second World War ended, Vimy re-emerged, coinciding with an important Canadian anniversary. There were a lot of discussion about identity uh, in the 60s because we were near the centenary of, uh, of Canada at the time. And Vimy was one of the, was part of this discussion about uh, uh, identity and what makes us Canadian. From Lester Pearson to Stephen Harper, Canadian leaders began referencing Vimy. That day in 1970, they was good enough to have the Maple Leafs bag and be working and fighting together. Every nation has a creation story to tell. The First World War and the Battle of Vimy Ridge are central to the story of our country. Pearson emphasized peacekeeping. Harper, Afghanistan. But each put Vimy in service to an idea of national unity even if that was at odds with what Canadians in 1917 thought of Vimy. It was divisive. It, uh, it pitted French against English, labor against capital, uh, farms against the cities. But that's forgotten now. Now it's a marker of nationhood, certainly in English Canada. But contrast the glowing idea of Vimy with the shabby condition of its monument by centuries end crumbling from decades of neglect. It amazed me that Canadian governments would have allowed the monument to fall into disrepair. Prime Ministers Chrétien, Martin, and Harper changed that, pumping in millions, rescuing the names. After three years of meticulous work, it was ready. Once you see it, you just never forget it. it is, it's a mesmerizing spectacle rising above. And as her uncle had done some 70 years before, Canada's sovereign was on hand to dedicate it. To Canada and to all who would serve the cause of freedom, I rededicate this magnificently restored memorial. I love the fact that we have to keep going back and asking ourselves questions about what these monuments mean to us. Struggling to understand it puts us on a road where we really begin to understand our country better and better each time. We choose what we say about our past. We select events that are important and have meaning for us, but it's also a reconstruction. And though the soldiers of Vimy are all gone now, their voices help us do that. We do regard Vimy as where Canada as a nation really started. When you've seen a man take a whiz bang in the stomach, you lost a lot of patriotism. Two distinct memories of Vimy, both rooted in history. The Vimy Memorial is pristine again, ready to teach us that history, if we would learn it. A battle that lasted less than a week, whose meaning we've interpreted for a century. However you choose to see it, the idea of Vimy Ridge will continue to rise up. Oh, soldiers never die. They simply fade away. Asking us not to forget.